The scriptural reading for this morning comes from the book of Hosea, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it is I who taught a frame to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever loved someone and not had that person love you back? We call it unrequited love. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of a little unrequited love, then you can understand what it must have been like for a man over in Taiwan. It seems that the man fell in love with a woman who had no use for him whatsoever. You have to give the man credit, however, for being persistent. Over the course of a two-year period, the man actually sent the woman 700 love letters. And his persistence paid off when the woman finally said, I do. That's right, she married the mailman who delivered the letters. <laughs> True story. It hurts when you ask someone to go out with you and the person says no. It hurts when one of your children says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. It hurts when you look up to someone and that person puts you down. That's what happened uh, to Alexis Rotella. In her poem, Purple, she talks about a moment of unrequited love a moment of pain that she experienced when she was a little girl. This is what she wrote. In the first grade, Mr. Lore said my purple teepee wasn't realistic enough, that purple was no color for a tent, that purple was a color for people who died, that my drawing wasn't good enough to hang with the others. I walked back to my seat counting the swish, swish, swishes of my baggy corduroy trousers. With a black crayon, nightfall came to my purple tent in the middle of an afternoon. In the second grade, Mr. Barter said, draw anything. He didn't care what. I left my paper blank, and when he came around to my desk, my heart beat like a tom-tom. He touched my head with his big hand and in a soft voice said, the snowfall, how clean and white and beautiful. Yes, it hurts when you love someone and that person doesn't love you back. And guess what? God also hurts when we don't return God's love for us. 
It's true, all you have to do is look at what God said long ago through the prophet Hosea. In the book of Hosea, God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Israel I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They offered sacrifices to their false gods and burnt offerings to their idols. Yet I was the one that taught Ephraim how to walk. I was the one that took them up in my arms. They did not know that it was I who healed them, that it was I who bent down and fed them. Like the people of Israel, God desperately wants us to love. God wants our love. God wants us and is calling us to love with all of our hearts and with all of our minds and all of our soul and all of our strength, not because God is jealous or insecure or needy. God isn't like the little girl on the playground who says, okay, you can be my friend, but if you're, not, if you're going to be my friend, you can't be anyone else's friend. God isn't jealous or insecure or needy. No, God wants our love because God knows that when we do that, or if we don't do that, our lives will fall apart. Our lives will eventually go downhill, which is exactly what happened to the people of Israel. Instead of loving God, they loved other gods. So they drifted away from God's love and God's truth. They lost sight of what's really important in life. And because of all of that, as was predicted, disaster did strike. In 721 BC, the Assyrians swooped down from the north and totally decimated and destroyed the kingdom of Israel. Sadly, the same thing seems to be happening today. In fact, I'm convinced that our unrequited love for God is one of the reasons why we now live in such an addictive society. More and more people are drifting away from God's love and God's uh, truth. And they're ending up feeling like something's wrong, like something's missing in their lives. So more and more people are turning to things to fill up that empty void. We read about it in the newspapers. People, more and more people, are turning to things like drugs and alcohol and gambling and material things. And heaven forbid, some people are even trying to fill that emptiness up with things like chocolate. When you drift away from God's wisdom and God's love, you end up like the man who was convinced that the whole world revolved around him and what he wanted. That was obvious one day when he went out on the golf course with a friend of his. While they were out there, the man noticed a funeral procession that happened to be passing by on a road next to the golf course. When the man saw the funeral procession, he immediately took off his hat. Then he bowed his head and he said a prayer. The man's friend was impressed. Wow, he said, that was a really nice thing to do. You really do have a good heart. Well, the man replied, it's the least I could do. After all, I was married to her for 35 years. God wants your love, not because God is needy, jealous, or insecure. 
God wants your love because God knows that your life will be better when you love God with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. God knows that when you do that, it will lead you to the peace that passes all understanding. God knows that it will lead you to the joy that you will never find out there in the so-called real world. God knows that it will lead you to the abundant life that Jesus was talking about when he said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. When you love God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength, you will be blessed. In fact, I guarantee that there will be moments when you feel the same way that a woman felt when she was inspired to write a variation on the much-loved poem, Footprints in the Sand. You all know that poem, right? A lot of people love that poem. Her version, though, is a little different, and it goes like this. One night, a woman had a dream. In the dream, she and the Lord were walking along a beach together, for much of the way, the Lord's footprints were steady and consistent. The woman's footprints, on the other hand, were all over the place. Zigs and zags, sudden starts and stops, and turn around circles. Eventually, though, the woman's footprints fell into line next to the Lord's. That's the way it went for many miles. Then something amazing happened. Suddenly, the woman's smaller footprints were inside the Lord's larger footprints. Gradually, the smaller footprints grew and grew until they disappeared entirely. Now there was only one set of footprints in the sand and the woman was filled with joy. But then something terrible happened. The second set of footprints reappeared, and this time both sets of footprints were all over the place. It was even worse than it had been in the beginning. Zigs and zags, more sudden starts and stops and turnaround circles, deep gashes in the sand. The woman was troubled by what she saw. So she asked the Lord about it. Lord, she said, I understand the first scene. I was lost and confused. But you stayed with me and you were very patient with me until I learned to walk with you. That is correct, the Lord said. Yes, the woman replied, and then when my footprints were inside your larger footprints, I was trying very hard to follow you very closely. That is correct, the Lord said. And then when there was only one set of footprints, I suppose I was becoming more and more like you in every way. Again, that is correct, said the Lord. You have understood everything so far. Then there was a pause. The woman thought for a moment and then said, but I don't understand. There were then two sets of footprints again, and it was even worse than it was at the beginning. Did I do something wrong? Was there a regression? Did I fail you? The Lord smiled and said, my precious child, don't you remember? That was when we danced. As you continue to make your way through the rest of this day and the rest of this week, remember that you are being called to love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your strength and all of your soul. Not because God is jealous or insecure or needy, God wants your love because the God who created you and the God who loves you wants to dance with you. Amen.